a day after the Chicago Bears press conference, we are now going to look in some key takeaways as I've left that conference enthusiastic, encouraged, yet worried and concerned all at the same time. Let's talk about that and more right after this. What is good, you all? This is your boy, PK with the Windy City Breeze. We are getting into what we, what I perceive from this press conference. And I think it's an opinion that needs to be heard because while many of us left that, that press conference and, and understanding and feeling hopeful of our future, there were some gaps and lows in that that made me feel as if there was a lot of nothing and a cause for major concerns. Let's just, let's just jump right into it. One of the first ones, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, Sit here and mix any words with it. Keeping Matt Eberflus was a huge risk. Now, I get Matt Eberflus as an individual showed that he can, one, lead men, especially on defense. And our defense was one of the better defenses in the second half of the season in the league. And considering how young we are, that is impressive. That is very, very impressive. And I can't take that away from Matt Eberflus. In fact, that is the one thing that I said may actually help save his job. Now, I said that tongue in cheek. I did believe it, but I didn't know that it would actually happen. I was like on a 60 40, he's going, he's out of here with Luke Gessie type situation. Now, the 40 happened, and I'm going to be really real with you. I believe in polls, I trust his decision making. I do believe that as a young GM, he's put himself in a fantastic position, and I cannot take anything away from him. But that does not mean that I agree with every move. Does not mean that I think he's perfect. And to be honest, this was the first one where I said, I don't know about that one. I'm going to trust you. I don't know about that one. And the main reason why is not because of some of the things that everyone else has said. And this may have been mentioned previously. A lot. There's been a lot of people speaking on this. But from my perspective, it's not. I don't look at the successes he had because the one thing I never questioned about Matt Eberflus and many people have not questioned is the fact that he is a good defensive coach. Everyone said that he was a good DC. In fact, most people, when they speak about Matt Eberflus, they say, hey, I don't want him as my HC. I don't want him as my head coach. I could take him as the DC, though. Like if he'll move over to DC, not realizing that that money don't money like that, dog, that money don't make sense. And first of all, I wouldn't. No one's going to take that type of demotion. No one's doing that. But in a in in. You know, in a fantasy world, yeah. If, if I could do that, I slide his punk behind right over. No problem. I'm with you. It ain't gonna happen. And the one thing I look at, although it may have came together from a player perspective later in this season, I look at the organizational failure that happened under his tutelage, and that is what I'm concerned about. Because we're not just talking about one side of the ball. On both sides of the ball, we were a dumpster fire for a good reason, and he had to personally jump in to handle that. What do I mean? What the heck happened with Allen? No one can give me anything definitive on what happened. We've we've had some speculation. We've heard you've heard it here on this channel. Pat has said it plenty of times. We've echoed it. What happened? That happened under Matt Eberflus, who hired him, who co-signed him, who's who said that this was it. Now, did they make a decision? Absolutely. They made a decision, and I can't fault a man for doing that, but that's strike one. I look at what happened egregiously on the offense week after week after week and the inflexibility that happened. Now, did we correct it at the end of the season? Yes. Maybe he was pigeonholed because he didn't have a D.C. Maybe. But there was opportunity for, I do believe, opportunity for, and we were even looking at one point for someone to help on the de defensive end so that we didn't necessarily have to have our head coach calling defensive plays. Now, I'm glad he did. It worked out. And Pose got him some help with Montez Sweat. Don't get me wrong. It worked out. I'm not talking about what happened on the field necessarily. I know people are going to say, well, that's crazy. I'm talking about the people that were in position to help him build this did, were not up to snuff on both sides, and that is on your head coach. 
What do I mean by that? Bill Belichick just did it two years in a row and ultimately ran the Patriots into the ground after, again, a, a decade, two decades of dominance. I'm not going to sit here and disparage Bill. Bill's the greatest coach of all time, in my opinion. He's definitely he's definitely the GOAT when it comes to coaches. But the last couple of years have been a dumpster fire for him because of decisions he made. His quarterback, if you want to say was was a game manager, stuff like that, was a pretty freaking good game manager, is was competing for stuff that he didn't have to compete. Why? Because you didn't have a good OC. You may, you put somebody who didn't wasn't qualified for that in that position. And now look what you got. It fell apart for Bill. That's why Bill's not in, in that situation anymore. And it's not like Bill is retiring as as of. 10 minutes ago, to my knowledge, he's in a, he's still interviewing, and there's interest in him interviewing for the Falcons. It fell apart because of the decisions he made, people he had under him. That's what happened with Matt Eberflus this season. People under him, that collapsed. Bill's a legendary coach. He got rings on top of rings. Argue with your mom on who, why. He got rings on top of rings. Tom Brady was a game manager for a good, for a good four seasons, and they was getting rings out of him. All right? He built that team. He was a good coach and GM. And he's out of there. And he has pedigree. Matt Eberflus is a young head coach. I get it. You can't sit there and just just, just write. But it was so egregious. It's like, he might not be here. It, this may have been. He may have been a little bit more than he can chew right now. And in a space where other organizations made drastic changes, especially since they had no playoff or Super Bowl contention hopes, for to be in this space where you have the opportunity to not just get rid of the OC, but to clean house to make sure that you understand that hey, there's a standard here. I thought this was the opportunity that Pose would take, and he didn't. I understand why he didn't, but I'm concerned. I look at the next part of it, and we look at how you evaluate moving forward. Now, I love the fact that he's wide open. I love the fact that there's. Um, he's very transparent in regards to that all options are on the table. He's always been transparent about that. But there was one moment in that presser that I felt was really interesting. And that's when he was really pressed about what he saw in the previous draft and why he wasn't wild or what he's looking for. And Ryan Post had two things to say. He said, I don't look at just the tape. I look at the person, the leadership, things of that nature. And I began to question how did you sit down if you sat down with CJ? How did you see CJ Stroud and not see that? I'm not talking about the tape. The tape could have been up and down, whatever. I still think CJ Stroud was clearly a, a good, I, he was good enough to be in that conversation with number one overall. I really did. I've never been a Bryce Young fan, stuff like that. And I'm not disparaging him for, for not picking CJ. Okay. But when I look at what CJ has put on tape this season as an NFL QB, I get his situation. D'Amico Ryan, the energy, the synergy that they've built there. You can't compare. It's not always apples to apples. But you know what was apples to apples for the Bears and the, uh, and the Texans? It's a lot of young kids on that on that roster. It's a lot of it's the, it was a lot of. Uh, I mean, mind you, they took the they took CJ Stroud and Will Anderson. There's a lot of young kids over there. It was a lot of people when their first go round at the at this position of oversight. It was Ryan's first position of oversight. He too, defensive coach, right? Look at how his organization ran, and look at how Matt Abrifus ran ours. Look at the trust in in the system that those young players had in that system, and look at the trust that was built with ours. Half the time we were questioning what the heck we were running. Half the time. So, no, I can't not compare the results necessarily. I can't sit there and say it was all apples to apples. But the things I can compare is they didn't start with more at this position. They didn't start with an experienced QB who ends up breaking records. They had a rookie QB. They didn't have they spent a lot of money on that line. Don't get me wrong. They spent money. They did spend money. Don't get me wrong. But it was all new. And this was their first year together. And you know what? C.J. Stroud was clearly a, one of the better leaders in the NFL, not just amongst his draft class, in the freaking NFL. So when I sit here and I look at how that type of talent passes you up, 
CJ Stroud literally is in a record. He sets a record for the TD and INT. He's amongst Tom Brady and I believe Joe Montana for, for this. D'Amico Ryan don't teach that man. Can't, can't throw that ball for that man. Tank Dale, I think, had maybe 800 yards before he got injured. Seven, 800 yards. Rookie receiver. They were clicking. Guess what? I'm not comparing Justin necessarily. I'm saying the decision made from the top led to them all being able to buy into a system. And that system worked. The decision from our top was to get with my Eberflus, my Eberflus. Oh, I'm losing my words. Matt Eberflus would then disseminate to everything else, and it was a dumpster fire. And you stuck with it. You stuck with it. We did. We, Nate, I mean, listen, Luke had to go, but we didn't have to stick with something that fell apart when realistically it should have been tightened in. And when I sit there and I hear Kevin Warren, which was the highlight of the whole thing for me, come in and speak with the conviction he did. I do get the sense that he didn't like it, but I do understand that they do know the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. I get that. But I wonder, is the organizational failure that happened underneath Matt Aberflus from his offensive coordinator, his instability, and how we rolled that out with clearly the whole locker room saying, hey, this is not working. We got Chase Claypool the heck out of here because he said this ain't working. He handled it in a very unprofessional manner. Don't get me wrong. But he wasn't wrong in what he was saying. He said that beginning of the season. We got him out here with the quickness. It didn't get much better. It didn't get much better. I'm a Justin Fields fan. But if we weren't going to sit there and put him in a situation where things were going to be better, I can't sit here and say that I want him as my Bears QB because we didn't give him the tools. He didn't have the tools necessary to actually compete. And that's why I said if you're going to sit here and have the opportunity to reset as a Bears fan more than I am of an individual player, Ryan Post, this was your grand opportunity, and we missed it. Second, last thing I want to say, and this is this is my concern. We didn't even give Jim Ball, Harbaugh a call, apparently. I understand. There's a lot of red tape behind that. But sticking with Matt Eberflus, not necessarily even considering those other options, and knowing that the league is now offense, more offensive-minded than it's ever been, you don't have to know football that well. You can sit there and listen to those who have played in the past and stuff like that. It's not necessarily a softer league. Well, hard maybe it is. It's a, it's a softer league. These are still that I think that's demeaning to say. It's a different league. It's a faster league, in my opinion, and it's more offensive oriented. And a lot of the people that we see have success today have either a really phenomenal OC who should be head coaches in some cases, or they have an offensive minded head coach who. Everyone rallies behind, and then look at what happened in Miami. I don't believe too it was a great QB. Mike McDaniel's get the offensive mighty Q, uh, head coach changes that entire organization. They got him some weapons. He has a line. Don't get me wrong. His piece is there. We have pieces in Chicago too, but it starts from the top. No one ever comes out of that situation feeling like Mike McDaniel's isn't the reason why they have made this massive leap. That man shows them basketball film for, for them running routes. Get the Come on, come on. There, It starts at the top. And we had the opportunity to change, and we didn't. That's a major, major concern for me. I also would have to say this. Ryan Pose, I still believe in Ryan Pose. I really do. I believe more in Kevin Moore. And I, I, I'll close with this. This is my key takeaway. The one thing I don't expect is for the Bears to be in a situation like we were in with Ted Phillips. That man spoke with such conviction, I wanted to suit up. I did. That's the type of attitude that we wanted to see from our head coach. That fire, that aggressiveness, you see it there. You get it. There's not one person on Twitter, things of that nature, that left that press conference, heard that, saw that, and did not speak about the conviction that he spoke with. That is a leader. He's a true leader. He's been around for a while, though. And continuity is a big thing for him, especially when he tells his stories about the Rams. 
So I get the decisions that were there. I respect the fact that you want to build with some familiarity. You don't want to overhaul everything. That's not how you build an organization. I get that. I totally understand the logic behind it. And I am on board. I want the Breeze Nation to be on board. I want everyone to sit there and just, just, I want, I want to calm us to come into it with open minds and, and, and calm hearts and things of that nature. But please be concerned. Because the next, if we trade back, we make some questionable decisions and Justin's not in. And we have another CJ Stroud or even close situation. We're now going to be sitting there wondering why we traded back twice. It's never happened in the history of the league. Why we've made these decisions. And so I look at this and I say, respectfully, please make the best decision for the Chicago Bears. As a Bears fan, I truly want the best decision. And if that's with Fields, please get him all the tools you need. There's no reason to continually trade back and get cute. When you have a game changing receiver there that we have the opportunity to get. Get that man some weapons. You can find some you can find good a good center and a good some good O line work in with the rest of the picks that we have. Please don't trade back. Get that man the best of the the best available. Yes, he needs another number two receiver. Darnell Mooney ain't gonna be here. Cole Komet, I, whatever. Get that man some weapons. Give him something to work with. If we're not going to, if we're going to sit there, get cute, do all that stuff, and if sh- please trade him somewhere. Let him go out, ball out somewhere else or develop somewhere else, and let's just reset. It's best that we do that now when we have the opportunity where everyone is 50-50 on it than for us to be in next season. We're talking about look at what we had and we fumbled the bag. And I'm tired of the Chicago Bears fumbling the bag. And I don't want that to be a stain on Ryan Poe's resume as it was for Ryan Pace, who had the number two and picked Mitch Trubisky, who I, you know, you've all seen my takes on Mitch in the past. But if you look at what we passed up, we can't do that again. Yes, I know there's other things to build out, but if you don't have that situation straight, your QB situation, Nothing else really matters. You want to know how we know? Mike Vrabel just got fired. He was a QB away. Mike Vrabel got fired and everyone was like, what are they doing? He was a QB away. Don't tell me the QB isn't all isn't the end all be all at the end of the day. When you were a QB away, you've gotten had massive success and you still got let go. Mike Tomlin is on the hot seat right now. He's a QB away. Kenny Pickett is throwing more picks than his name. It's, Kenny Pickett will throw a pick. That's what he's doing. It's a QB matters. And if we're in a situation where, hey, that may be the best option, do it. Be decisive. Let's move on. Let's go. But don't do this him and Han stuff like that. I trust Pose. But again, I have my concerns. But I want to hear your thoughts, man. Whether it's love, whether it's hate, put it in the chat. I could go on and on about this one. I am more encouraged from what I heard from Kevin Warren and how he approached it and things of that nature. I am not going to sit here and make it seem as if I am just writing off um, uh, Ryan Poles and things of that nature. But again, most of us feel this way. We ain't feeling too hot about that decision to keep keep Poles. I mean, keep uh, Flues. And that may come back to haunt us. And I hope it don't. For all of our sake. Till next time.